Welcome to Popcast, a Patterns of Power podcast, discussing grammar in the context of the reading and writing connections. I'm Jeff Anderson, and I'm Travis Leach, and we're your hosts today for Episode 7, Step 5, Part 2, Part 2 of the Patterns of Power process, Invitation to Apply. It's so important we have two episodes. And I'm gonna hand it over to Travis to tell us about these things that are in chapter three of Patterns of Power, inviting adolescents into the conventions of writing for grades six through eight. And in case you haven't been binge listening to our (laughs) podcast, uh, we're gonna just take you back real quick to part one of the invitation to it, where we discussed invitation to apply strategies that you can use in your classroom. One that we discussed is responding to something that students are reading in the class. Another that we talked about is having students think through or summarize content. Two things to mention, or one thing to mention about these two strategies is that it's really successfully hitting some of the language art standards, that those standards of response in various ways and standards around comprehension. So if you want to think about really piling on some effective uh, standard uh, interaction during your teaching, these are are two really nice applications that you can use. And then there's starting a collection we talked a little bit about, but don't forget how that's really going to help develop those observational cognitive structures. And remember, observational cognitive structures are what all other cognitive structures are built upon so this observation this interaction with the world around us this application of just looking and seeing and noticing and observing is really powerful to help the kids actually become confident and com- comfortable using the, the the pattern or standard we've been uh, addressing and then we discussed Rapid revisions. Rapid revision. And quick edits. Quick edit. (laughs) And we talked about that rapid revision, looking at remixing writing that you have to add the pattern that we are working with. And quick edits as revisiting our writing and focusing on the convention or that pattern as it already exists in our writing to confirm that we have used it correctly, or if not, to make make that quick edit and fix it. Well, so it's so the difference would be that, like, I always tell the kids when you read your writing twice, the reader only has to read it once. When you read your own writing once, I mean twice, the reader only has to read it once. Now, a, a writer friend of mine was like, twice? That's not nearly enough. You've got to read it like 70 or 80 times. I'm saying we're working with middle school students here and it's a miracle to get them to reread it once. <laughs> but if they reread it twice, they're going to be able to see things. And, we, and we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about a community editing checklist, which will interact with this quick edit. Or as I said earlier, quick edit. Yeah, really here we're ensuring that what students leave on the page is what they meant to leave on the page. Leave it all on the page. We're, that's what we're doing with that. <laughs> so we have two more application options that we wanted to discuss with you in our episode today. Just We didn't want that first episode to be 45 minutes long. So we're going to focus on these last two applications that we suggest and we offer some support with in chapter three of the Patterns of Power book. And one that we're gonna look at today is conferring stems. We're gonna talk about that to kind of set the tone or set us off with our episode today. The first thing you might notice about the conferring stems of the six is the only one that the teacher actually does. Uh, You're still interacting with students, but early on in the book, we talked about this power of making writing not about being right or wrong, but about meaning and effect. 
And that requires that when we give feedback to kids or we interact with them about the writing, that we don't say things that make them feel like we're thinking about writing as right and wrong. We want to make them feel like it's about meaning and effect. So how do you do that when you talk to them? Because they're going to make mistakes. We know this happens. So you might start off, uh, the stems are like beginnings and that you're going to just apply. Like, talk to me about your choice to not use any punctuation. Talk to me about your choice to not use a comma here. Whatever that is, tell me about your decision. We're putting it back on the writer as it's a writer's choice. Author's purpose, author's craft. In another situation, they might read it like you might ask them, would you read this aloud to me? And they read it out loud to you and they make pauses between their sentences or they make some sort of pause. Then you could ask them, see, when you read it aloud, I noticed that you, when you read it aloud, I noticed that you paused here. Are you, what could we do as a writer to show the reader that pause? Or tell me about your thinking here. And they're, you'll notice they're kind of open-ended and they're just stems. Do you need that comma? Do you need that quotation mark? Do you need that? Well, if you've got this first quotation mark, what, what do you need on the other side of it to tell me when it's over? Another way to say it is, are you missing anything here? Looking at their dialogue or whatever it is. And then you can also ask him something like open-ended like this. If you just walk up and you're not like looking and you don't see a particular mistake or anything that you think you need to address, uh, tell me about something you're doing as a writer that will help your reader understand or hear your point. Tell me something you're doing as a writer that will help your reader understand your point or your piece. These kinds of questions invite the kids into conversation. We know that conversation about meaning and effect is what we want. And if that's what we want, then we need to do that. And that's what the conferring stems kind of scaffold me as a teacher. And they're really helpful for me to look back at every once in a while to help me remember that. And what I appreciate about incorporating these into conferring with students is that when they when they've worked in this space a little bit and have had the opportunity to discuss their thinking as a writer, that transfers over when they're doing partner or small group writing work together where they have the language and they have the ability to have deeper conversations. And instead of one student reading to another and that student saying, oh, that was really good. They have the ability to, to pinpoint specific places and have deeper discussions about, hey, tell me, why did you choose dialogue there? Um, and then not in this part right here. So kids develop their ability to have the, those deeper conversations, which as you're passing around the class, it's it like gives me goosebumps just to hear kids having conversations like that. Well, and you know, the, the cool thing is going to be that that's going to transfer over to their analysis of text. So when they're asked to talk about it, why the author made choices that he or she made, they're going to be able to have a conversation about that because we've been scaffolding it in small bite-sized chunks of talking about meaning and effect as our emphasis rather than right or wrong. And it's going to happen. Great point. Let's talk about our next. I'm full of great points. Yes, you are. Let's talk about our next uh, idea for application, and that is creating a community editing uh, chart or something. Community editing editing agreements that we, we as love a class the word can, agreements can work with. We love agreements because agreements means it was is the word that conventions comes from. Agreement between writer and reader that this is how this is going to be. So the community editing agreements. We probably don't put checklist, but it's up to you. But the reason we would like to say agreements rather than checklist is you know why. We don't have to tell you. You know why. Yeah, it's really nice as an anchor chart that's ongoing throughout the semester or throughout the school year. I've had it as simply as seeing it or seen it as simply as just being on a bulletin board with either sticky notes or small colorful note cards popping onto that bulletin board. Sentence strips. Yeah, so it's really a, a great 
for me, thinking about the end of a, like moving toward the end of this process to get another check on the temperature of our the, of the class. Do we have this down? Do we feel confident about this pattern? Do we feel confident enough to be accountable for it yeah, in our to, writing? To own it and be accountable for it. And students will be really honest with you. So so you're saying don't put it on the list until the kids agree. So the another part of that word agreement is we don't post an agreement and say we all agreed we're doing these things we ask the kids literally like are you ready to be accountable for this and they can say no and if they say no then we ask them what is it that you need to be able to feel confident enough to put that on there and then that list starts out blank at the beginning of the year and grows and then that's what we do when we do a quick edit we can use that list of things that we've worked through and spent a couple of weeks on and they really know and understand to look at their own writing for to make sure that they've done those things because they know them it's an empowering anchor for students to look at when you suggest they go back and do some editing on their their writing because they see, oh, these are all the things that I know overtly we've worked on these things in class and interacted with them. I feel confident that I can not only pick these out and find them in my writing, but I understand how that pattern works successfully. And also what ends up going on these community editing agreement lists are the focus phrases. And this focus phrase for lesson 6.4 is I use the comma which to add detail. The focus phrase is I use the comma which to add detail. Now then that actually gets posted on a sentence strip or on a chart on that editing agreements list. And it's in the iVoice. Remember, it's important in the iVoice because it makes them feel like that's their power. It's their choice. It's about effect. And I use the comma which to add detail because that's craft wise what it's for. And instead of just putting up capitalization and putting a box next to it that they're supposed to check off. That's not teaching grammar. Teaching grammar is giving them to the point where they've had the experience and the understanding and the confidence. And then when they're ready, we add it to that checklist and it builds over the year and they're ready to apply it. This is application two. Remember, application is so important. That's why this is in the application choices. Well, real quick, before I forget, yeah. remember each lesson has a particularly crafted invitation to apply that comes in addition to all these. We've already discussed that. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted Let's to look at the comma that. witch. Let's talk about that. So here in the comma witch lesson, it actually adds something. Ooh, dangerous, because it's like its cousin. The cousin of which, W-H-I-C-H, is that, T-H-A-T. I guess I don't need to spell that. <laughs> anyway, um, comma witch and that. Students begin to understand the comma always precedes which. However, the relative pronoun that is on its own. No comma, take that. So then we put a couple of sentences from Jason Reynolds, who did the original mentor sentence we've been studying, in which he uses that and he uses which so that they get to study that same author and see him using that and which and then telling the difference. So we're incorporating that compare and contrast and that invitation in this application, giving them just one more nudge. And so the, the direction after studying the census, oh, let me read the sentences. I always had the feeling that if I could just get on, I'd be the next LeBron. I always had this feeling that if I could just get on, I'd be the next LeBron. So we have the that in that sentence with no comma. On the track, the high knees were followed by jumping jacks and some warm up laps around the track, comma, which seemed like a really bad idea to me. Don't we know that feeling in our exercise class? On the track, the high knee things were followed by jumping jacks and some warm up laps around the track, comma, which seemed like a really bad idea to me. So here they're getting to compare the use of which and that, no comma with that, comma right before the which. And in an after that, it says, after talking through each sentence and what the students see, pairs choose one to imitate, that or which. But don't forget the comma which, if you use which. Yeah, so this application suggestion just broadens students' understanding around relative pronouns. So they should have a really solid grasp of 
comma which and its use, usage, but that co the cousin that has very similar meaning and effect to it. So we add that in as another option for students in their writer's toolbox to because use. contrast teaches. So what about the pitfall? Give me a pitfall and let's unfall. Let's put the pit out of the fall. Yeah, I think a, a big pitfall might be you notice in the invitation to imitate that your kids really knocked it out of the park. It seems like they really have this pattern down. So you think that maybe you could save some time by skipping this and moving on to either the invitation to edit. It's Friday, I must move on for next week for something new. Yeah, or another convention. So talk about why the importance of the invitation to apply here if we haven't talked about it enough. I think we sort of nauseatingly have talked about why it's so important. <laughs> I think it's important because it's giving them one more opportunity and we can't skip it and we probably need to stretch it more than skip it. Stretch it more than skip it. And you know what I'm hearing? Oh. I'm hearing yep. the theme. So when don't forget, go back and read chapter three of the book if you if you want more answers on this. We did two episodes already. We need to get off here because our theme song's playing. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Stenhouse.com, for being our sponsors. That's S-T-E-N-H-O-U-S-E.com. Thank you so much. And next time we'll be talking about the invitation to edit, which is really helpful with testing and all that stuff. So come back and see us in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to talking to you soon. Bye-bye.